Hello and welcome to the Media Bowl Podcast, where we talk all things content creation. Whether you're hitting record for the first time or you're working on your next big budget film, we want to give you all the tactical tools and advice to make sure that you are ready to go the next time you hit the record button. I'm Eric. I'm Justin. And today we're going to be talking about storytelling. We are a storytelling company. Yes. I think it's very easy to say, oh, we're a film company. Oh, we're a video agency. Now nah, we're a storytelling company. We're going to talk today about why that's important and why we feel... Like we stress so much about it because it, I want to say it's a new thing, but I think it's, it's taken on a new life, if you will. So I'm starting out, we did this in a previous episode and I'm going to do it again. And I want your thoughts on this. I, while you were in the bathroom between episodes, asked Notion AI to explain to me, to define storytelling from a filmmaker's perspective. And I mm. really like what it dished out. So I'm going to read this out. These AIs are... Mm-hmm. This one's actually a lot better than what it normally gives me to. Uh, so in filmmaking, storytelling is the process of conveying a narrative through the use of visual and auditory elements. It involves the creation of characters, settings, and events that together form a cohesive and engaging story. Effective storytelling in a film requires a combination of technical skill, creativity, and an understanding of the intended audience. The goal is to immerse the viewer in the story and create an emotional connection that resonates long after the film has ended. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the podcast. Yeah, that I'm impressed by that answer, <laughs> quite honestly. But you can you can pop it open now if you feel like you need to. But talk talk through that. Go d- give me a deep dive on that. I mean, yeah. So I guess I'll bring it back. Our job as filmmakers is to have the knowledge, have the tactics, have the planning, have the processes to do all the things that the AI, you know, is explaining. Yep. And that's why I believe AI will never take our jobs because that needs to happen. I don't know, Justin, that was a pretty good Well, I mean, definition. that's a great definition, <laughs> great definition. But I don't know if it's ever going to be shooting and, you know, no, handling yeah. a crane and concepting and doing all those little details that make it a human story and a human perspective. And that's I think that's... What's really key, but yeah, storytelling. We had an episode about pre-production and all that, and it really does start in pre-production so that you can, you know, get your the proper tools you need. You can get the proper gear ordered to make the the, the correct shot that you need to tell the story in a certain way that's going to invoke emotion. And we'll talk a little bit later about how you know different shot types, you know, you know, provide you with different feelings. Um, yeah, storytelling is is amazing and something that I did want to mention. It's it's one of the greatest mediums, storytelling, and it's something that's been done all through human nature, all through human existence, whether it be cave writings on a wall or whether it be poetry or whether it be, you know, theater plays, all those type of different things. Storytelling has been around for forever and is not going anywhere because it's the easiest way for us to connect as humans. Uh, us as filmmakers are living in the, maybe one of the greatest age, ages of storytelling because we have the technology to literally tell a campfire story, you know, in the best way where you can sit down at your house and watch it on TV, you know. So, you know, maybe even a good, you know, a, a good tool or thing you can do is sit down and just tell stories. I'll, I tell stories to my daughters before bed and just make up stuff, but it's when you kind of have a good structure and understand what storytelling is, it's really engaging and it's really um exciting and it helps them fall asleep and uh storytelling is here to stay it's been here forever so understanding that concept is is super powerful yeah i think you know i just when you were giving examples i always think um you know there's a there's a simpsons episode where there's like an old man that's just sitting at a bench but like the, the camera kind of pans to him and then there's a whole bunch of little kids and they're like, oh, an old man, let's go sit down. And he just like goes in and, you know, they don't obviously share the whole story, but it you know, goes into a whole bunch of stories. So, you know, there there's just that aspect of that's it. You know, you talk to grandma, grandpa, they got stories. Man, the elderly folks are the best people to learn storytelling from because their minds are telling you, they're recounting memories and they do a you know they do a good job of like being detailed because they know you weren't there and you don't even understand that era so they have to be a little bit more you know you know explain more and dive a little deeper and you know listening to your elders you can learn a lot 
Yeah. And, and if there's little kids around, you know they're going to ham it up a little bit. So you get right. a little bit of that in there oh, yeah. as well. So, no, I think that's that's super interesting. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose this, and I'm maybe it's somewhere we go, maybe it's somewhere we don't go, but why do you think storytelling has taken up new legs as of late? I think... And we talked about this before, the advent of social media and and just quick content and putting out content quality or quantity over quality, I think has uh, watered down the storytelling skill, number one. And then there's a lot more people that are just making content that really aren't storytellers. They're not, you know, skilled in that regard. They don't understand that. I think in the past, you know, when all you had was printed media and, you know, early television, like those were the best of the best in the world at storytelling. So that's what you were used to. Now anybody can pick up a phone and make things. So not everyone is going to be that level of storytelling. So the people that understand that concept, whether you are a new creator or not, um, tend to have a lot more success because they're more engaging. And it's all about engagement, right? But I mean, for instance, I was watching, there's a there's a office page where they just show their office. And there's this one guy that has the best office ever. And all he does is walk through the door and show the office over and over and over. And every post, every day is that, the same thing. There's no storytelling there. It's just show me what you got. Then there are other creators that actually, you know, have skits and concepts around, you know, what it's like to be a gamer or whatever. And that is much more engaging. And I, you know, follow that and get, you know, in controlled in that type of um, content way easier than the person is just showing me what you got making content over and over and over. Storytelling is like how you, you know, find the heart and soul of whoever that, that page is, you know, and the people that do it well, like I said, I think have that engagement and that um, retention with the audience. Yeah. I think that that's super important. And, you know, as, as I was prepping for, for this episode, you know, I kind of, Pose that to myself, and I was like, you know, it's interesting. Is it a, is it a money thing? Is it a times are changing thing? Is it a, you know, there's so many things mm-hmm. that I'm like, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe it's all of them. Yeah, I, but it's it's so interesting because like when I'm just gonna vaguely describe the time, like when Casey Neistat was like doing the daily vlog and everything. Like obviously, I'm not getting. I'm not saying that from the point of storytelling because obviously he was the best at that for for the platform at the time. But, you know, it was a content world. And I don't know if that just got stale or if then it was like, okay, but what's the way to stand out? And and it's interesting because social media became a thing and then different types of social media became a thing. It's not just my space. Your storytelling isn't based on the 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 emo song from the 2000s that you have with the background that you HTML yourself. But now it's, okay, I have six seconds with Vine to grab people. I have, you know, obviously there's time. Time isn't as much of an issue on social media anymore, but I have, you know, I have to hook them in. I need a story to, to bring them in. Is it because there's so much saturation now that we've gotten to the point of, all right, well, just throwing things at the wall doesn't work anymore because it's so much saturation in the market. Now I have to actually be good well, the, the platforms all ask for different inputs. True. So like TikTok started out as, you know, musically or whatever, and it was just people doing quick dances, and that became a culture. It's a culture thing. So then a lot of those content creators were, you know, TikTokers were the dancers, right? But then now it's starting to take a life of its own with like quick stories, the short form, like, you know, fun explainer videos or like you know the cooking videos we actually learn something that's storytelling you know you know when you start you talk about ingredients start to finish it has a beginning here are the ingredients it has a middle here's me cooking and here's the end the final food you know what i mean so those type videos started to take over and now there are content creators of all different facets on all different platforms that are learning to leverage whatever they're given and tell stories and the better that people are at that i think better that they're going to do on the platform. It does take a lot more effort, I think, to do that. And you're seeing a lot more resources put behind some of these creators that back in the day might just be, you know, on their cell phone. Like we talk about all over the place, like 
I was just watching like Linus Tech Tips or whatever. The amount of people that are involved in his productions is rivaling like you know TV channels. Yeah. Like uh, so it's it's there's a lot more coming with it, but like at the end of the day, it's all storytelling and the people that are doing that well. To me, it just I don't think it ever went anywhere. I think that there was just less people that understood it and social media was so new that a lot of people weren't really doing it there. But if you really look at like Vine and like um, King Bach and and uh, Logan Paul and them, they were telling stories, they were doing ridiculous stuff, but it was like skits and funny, like humor, like they just leveraged that platform for how it was created to be used and tend to be used and told stories with, it. even with captioning and, um, in your descriptions, people that have better descriptions and are telling a story about what they do tend to have better retention because people success. people are like wanna they want to know more, you know. Yeah, so we we you kind of mentioned vaguely, you know, beginning, middle, and end. There's a three act structure. We work with people that have an eight act structure. That aside, why is it important to implement a structure to your story? Yeah. So I, I learned this a long time ago that a lot of writers, um, they know how their story is going to end before they start writing the story. <clears throat> so when you know where your story is going to go, it's a lot easier to craft and, and character develop because all the decisions that characters are supposed to make throughout the story are all a culmination of how the final product is. Um, I think people, they just start making and they forget like, it has to go somewhere and have a payoff. And without the payoff, there's no like, I don't want to watch anymore. If you did hook me and do all the, you know, cheeky things to get me to watch, and then the ending is like, Meh. like I don't want to watch it. It's anymore. a fool me once, shame on you, fool me exactly. twice. Yeah. So when you have a really solid ending and you understand that that's like what it's about, even if it's, you know, leaving another hook so that they watch the next video, which you see like, oh, in part two, check this part, you know, the finished renovation or whatever. Yeah. It, it makes me want to go watch again, right? So it's about having the ending and then building your story kind of backwards, reverse engineering it and um, working towards that. How have we implemented that concept in some of the work that we've done? Yeah, how have we implemented it? Well, number one, working with clients, one of the questions we ask them is like, where is this video going to live and what's the, um, what's, what are you trying to get out of this? Yeah. You know, whether it be sales, whether it be you know getting more people out there or just getting a message out there or donations that's kind of our ending so and now we try to figure out how do we do that in a creative way now we can reverse engineer that and let's say it's um you know it's a charity that wants donations and we need to you know tell this story okay that's our ending now we want to tell the story of the charity start at the beginning how it was formulated put together people that it's affected maybe some of the research going into that development and here's how you can help and be a part of it and that's our ending and that's our culmination um but always ask those questions up front or if you're developing something you know for yourself what what am i trying to tell with this story what's the purpose of it because if you don't have purpose or why there's no point of really starting anything you know if you you know if something affected you greatly and you want to make a film about it you have the why now you need to figure out okay what's the ending and what do i want people to take away from this this piece of you know material you know so how does how slash why does storytelling work throughout so many different mediums you know you look at video you you know everything has its own quirks and pros yeah. and cons but i'd be hard pressed to find a, a creative medium that doesn't somehow have story involved it's the easiest way to engage people and keep them focused on what you're doing. Yeah. Like, it's like if I took a picture of this plant and just sent you the picture of the plant without telling you anything about it, you'd be like, what is that? I would text you, thank you for that beautiful picture of the plant, yeah. but I need some story. But if I say, if I do a video of the plant and I'm like, hey, dids, check out this plant that my family brought back from you know, this tropical country, there's only 100,000 left of those species. So I'm trying to help reinvigorate the population of plants in the world. Would you like to have one? 
I even just looked at your face. You're like, where am I? I'm telling you a story. Yeah. You're like, oh, what is, he, yeah. what is he talking about? I'm going to stop you, though. I just made that up. Yeah, no, I, I, but I like that. So then tell me how that story works through different mediums. Because you, you, went, to, yeah. you went to video accidentally. Right. Tell me how that could work as a photo. Tell me how that, because yeah. I'm, I, I'll right. just, maybe I'll answer it first, you know, in, in how I'm thinking it to help you get context to the question. But, you know, you went to video, but in my head, I'm like, okay, but that photo could be taken. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, your example was just here in the studio, but like, if you wanted to tell a story, like we're, yeah. reality is out of the window for this example, but like, it could be in a, in a rainforest that's maybe mostly torn down and it's one of few left right. writing you could you know basically what you said could be the, the copy of the photo and could work mm -hmm. as that so well yeah we we take posts sometimes and we have to format it for different um, platforms because it's just like the way but yeah right in the copy next to the photo now you have something you can read that engages you and why do you think people read books storytelling they're learning there's information uh, no, I don't yeah, but it's been around for thousands and thousands of years and not going anywhere because people like to be engaged and locked into a story and what's going to happen next. Um, I could have a whole book about, you know, these specific plants and why we need to save them. I could have a TikTok that's quickly explaining this, this, and this and why that's happening. I could have a whole film where we go to the jungle and we bring back some and we replant them and try to, you know, bring up a new, you know, grow them somewhere. No matter the medium or what you're kind of talking about, there is a way to kind of, you know, share it so that it's engaging and it is storytelling. Yes, I think that that's a beautiful way to put it. And I think it's important for people to understand that we're all, you know, we're, we're filmmakers. So we're like, all right, how does this turn out through video? But like, it's so easy to copy paste that into anything. You could make a painting about it. You could write a song about it. You could mm -hmm. put a haiku poem together about it. It's all universal. All things are done through story. So how do we tell that story? Mm. Let's talk about some gear selection. We're going to kind of swing now back to the filmmaking side because that is truly what we are. Let's talk about gear. There are a lot of different ways that when we're on set, we're even in pre-production. We went through that in the last, you know, couple episodes ago yeah you know, how do we make these selections and why do we intentionally do certain things to tell blank story yeah um <clears throat> when i'm concepting and early pre-production we talk about mood so mood with the story i think is one of the places i like to start and um with that is like okay are we going to light it low key look is it going to be a little like kind of gritty and like is the story there that you know is it a um is it a dark kind of you know topic that's kind of you know hits you and makes you feel some type of way maybe our lighting needs to be a little bit more grungy and the location needs to be a little more dirty to kind of explain that feeling a little bit more or is it a hollywood or a holiday commercial it needs to be brighter and have warm you know, light and like make you feel cozy, right? So once we figure that out at the beginning, that helps me to decide, okay, what kind of gear do I need to use? And as a filmmaker, you know, um, lighting, number one, I kind of start with, okay, I want to use these type of lights. I want, um, you know, I might want the overhead, you know, kind of look to make you kind of feel, you know, a little bit, uh, what's the word, uh, mysterious. You know, I may have that type of look and I'm going for that kind of have the Godfather look because that's the kind of look that I want to go for. So I know that overhead lighting and, and hard light um, will make that character look and appear to be more gritty and scary. Or I may have, you know, a beautiful person that we want to accent their skin tones and, and I might go with a more soft look, maybe have a lot more diffusion and just really do the, the Rembrandt lighting and just make them look, you know, more of a beauty look. Um, so all of that is kind of in that mood at the beginning. And so then I take my mind to what type of lighting do we want to use? Um, and from there, it's, you know, the, the camera side of it, the next idea, the thing that I want to look at there is, okay, if we have budget, what type of lenses, what type of look with the lenses do I want to go with? Do I want, you know, sharp tack lenses that give you that, you know, 
almost clinical digital field? Or do I want, you know, something that has some character to it, it's a little softer of a lens that, you know, has some different distortions and things that make you just kind of feel kind of kind of filmic, like old school film. Um, you start making those decisions there if you have the budget. And um, that's all pre-production in my mind, you know, because once you get to the day of the shoot, you're working with your gaffers and your grips, with the lighting you selected, you've sent them over your, your mood board, you sent them over your shot list, you know, uh, different, you know, shots that you are inspired by for this, this shoot. And now it's up to that kind of portion of it. Um, and we can talk about this next maybe, but like the shot types and the different framing yeah, so so maybe those. maybe the best way you kind of already started on the lighting, so maybe we can skip past that. But let's say there's I'm thinking about this at the drop of the hat, so I might be mixing this up. But let's say there's three main elements: lighting, audio, visual. Mm -hmm. So you kind of covered the lighting. Yeah. So feel free. I think you're going to spend the most time on visual, so maybe audio next. Okay. So yeah, for me, audio is you know soundtracks, soundtrack to your life. You know what kind of mood, and this is. You've seen, I've seen a lot of different things where people will put different songs on the same footage and it feels completely different, right? So you, depending on the, the mood, and we all know music makes you feel, for me, maybe one of the things that makes me feel the most emotional, I can get that feeling really quickly, listen to music. So having the proper soundtrack to go with the mood, if I have a sad scene where, you know, someone died and we're trying to like deal with our emotions, like I'm not gonna have an upbeat happy tempo song there right um so yeah finding the right mood that matches that the sound effects even with like um you know the dialogue of those those scenes you know it's really important to kind of have everything cohesive with the sound in one port and for me like that's something that a lot of it happens in post you can maybe find references for things um leading up to shoot day if you're like okay this scene is going to be like a really you know, this, maybe this is a fight scene. I want to up-tempo, action pack. I might have that and have that be playing that the day before our shoot just to kind of get a vibe for what we're about to go into. And it, the song might change, but you know the emotion you want with the music, right? Um, getting into, like, the camera side of it, though, you know, there's a lot of different decisions that are made on, you know, shot type and focal range. Uh, if you want to make somebody look confused, for instance, and they're not sure what's going on and they're looking around in a room lost, I would probably do that with a super wide lens really up under them and close to them. And now it gives the appearance that they have like, like their brain is moving faster than they need to be moving, right? Or you could even like mess around with the shutter speed so it looks a little blurry so they're just kind of lost in the, in the sauce. So that's like a decision in camera that you can make to help tell the story further and make them feel, you know, a little bit like lost, right? Or I can shoot with a 200 millimeter lens from way back and that compression makes them feel almost like they're trapped inside themselves. You know, so that gives a different emotion versus like a nifty 50 making them look like perfect, you know what I mean? So it depends on what you're trying to go with. You know, if I have a... Um, this is kind of a frame kind of thing, but a uh, point of reference, if I want to try to make a character feel bigger than life, larger than life, a hero, I bring my camera a little bit lower and I shoot up at them. And then whoever they're talking to, we may shoot a little down at them and it gives the appearance that this person has power over this person. And a lot of great filmmakers use that to their advantage with the dialogue. And sometimes the dialogue may change the conversation and that actually switches and you feel that with the camera angles. And it's a really interesting thing. If someone's having a tough day and they're depressed, that camera might be higher looking down at them and it, it gives a perspective that they're in like trapped in their own world. I think the, the most interesting part, this sucks from our perspective, because as filmmakers, we can't watch something and not pick it apart. Yeah. But I <clears> want <throat> people that maybe aren't as knowledgeable to know that whatever you watch every single thing is done intentionally. intentionally there's nothing that's not done on purpose that goes to the camera lens that's used that's gone to the lighting in the set that's gone to the angle that they're at the wardrobe the set everything design. yep um so yeah feel free to dive into how important set design wardrobe things like that are 
Yeah, so all of that all helps to tell that story. If you're doing a, a period piece from the 1920s, right? Like you want to source the materials and the clothing that they were wearing there to help you feel like you're in that world. And it helps tell a story. You may have a character that has dirty, dingy clothes. They walk in a room, I can, with a room with people with nice buttoned up suits and things that are, you know, pressed to the nines. That's going to tell me that maybe they come from a different demographic than the people that they're talking to. And it's also going to tell me that without having to tell me. Right. And filmmaking is when it's done well, it shows it doesn't. It speaks. answers the questions that you the, didn't know that you have because you don't have to ask them because it's doing it for you. Yeah. That's a long way to say it, but that's essentially what's happening. Yeah. Show, not tell. Um, if a character has to come out and say, oh, my clothes are so dirty because I haven't made any money the last two years. Like, that's bad dialogue. That, that's a bad video game with really bad dialogue. Right. Because <laughs> I've seen those. But if they walk in and you see all these things and they... They haven't shaved in months. Like, you know that they're going through some stuff versus the contrast of maybe someone they're talking to that's all, you know, shaved up. It's, if you want to look it up, and I don't know everything about filmmaking. I'm always constantly learning. But the concept is the, the language of filmmaking. And if you look up that, you can find a lot of different resources that really do explain, you know, especially from camera side, what these different camera angles and, um, shot sizes do as far as feeling of a character. Um, you know, if you want somebody going on an epic journey, you almost always see these super wide shots and landscapes and them moving, and it just gives you the feeling that like they're on the way on a journey. You know, yeah. it's Lord of the Rings, and they're finding, they're looking for the ring, right? Like, there's a story and a language, and these things have been done over and over, and it's really, it's, um, it's something that's kind of routine to filmmakers. Like it's standard and their rules to filmmaking and the rules that can be broken if they're broken purposefully. This is true. And when they Fourth are, breaks, it works like really there are purposeful examples of yeah. breaks. Yeah. And then there's, you know, things with the 180 degree rule where, yeah. you know, it just, if you're not doing that properly, it's throwing the audience out of like, they're not. Again, it does, like I said, unintentionally, you don't know it because you're like, some just, Ain't right, but like you might not know that. Not exactly what it is, but sometimes filmmakers will break that rule, and it's be, they're breaking it on purpose to help show like a change in, you know, someone's you know the story. mindset. Really, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of great resources on different uh, things, like you know whether it's shot sizes or what type of lighting for what type of situation, and it's really important to understand all those things so that you can make the right decision especially for your clients and things you're doing. Uh, you don't want to have these dark, dim, low-key lit commercial for somebody that's like selling animals, animal like sweaters or something, right? Like they, they may not want that look. And if you, that's all you know how to do, then, you know, you kind of, you know, you make yourself kind of messed up, you know? We're both nerds. Mm -hmm. So we're different type of nerds. We're different type of nerds, nerds, but I'm getting video games. We're both video game nerds. Yes. Um, so I, I really forgot about it, asking this until, you know, you kind of brought up, but one thing that I think is important and I'm going to not directly call out storytelling here, but I'm going to use a term called conveyance. And to me within a video game, good conveyance is basically to say, it's mostly relating to control scheme if, or like how the game presents itself to you. If I'm... <laughs> walking around and I need pop-up bubbles to tell me every button, why it works, how it works, that's bad conveyance. If I'm walking around and level and I'm like, where in the heck do I go? Bad conveyance. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is you know, in, in my personal episode, I talked about Super Metroid. That game starts with a, it is, all right, Super Metroid lore is, is vast and confusing, but it was the third game created and a sequel to the second game essentially um but the beginning of the game is basically a you see the character the visor is like half cut off like i just got back from a mission and she's telling you the story text pops up visuals pop up before you go in you know exactly why you're there you know exactly what your mission is 
and this is Super Nintendo, so they do like it a, in a way that... It's a that, prelude exactly. so you know what happened before. But then you basically go through your tutorial level, which basically forces you to learn the controls by doing great conveyance. And then you get to a part where you get into a room, an empty room, you see the Metroid, and then you're like, all right, I want this. So you're like, I'm going to pick this up, but you can't. And then the bad guy basically shows up, takes it away. Um, so within that... Um, we really feel then that because of that, you know exactly what's happening, you know exactly your mission, and immediately you feel it. Mm-hmm. You feel exactly what's happening, you know exactly your problem, you know exactly why you're there, you know exactly what you need to do, and then you go do it. And that game to me is just one of the best examples of like a story within a video game. Is there any more that like stand out to you? Night in the Woods is a great indie game. I'm just going to drop that yeah. because it's like my favorite story game. Go look at it. Beautiful story, well conveyed. Go. <laughs> oh man, I mean, <laughs> so many. There's so many. Um, I think instead of me talking about all these storytelling aspects and within games that I like, I think it's cool. Like, like that game. Instead of wasting your tutorial time, it actually moved the story forward while helping you get acclimated to what the buttons are and what the, those things are. And I think that's what really good games will, even if it adds in a new mechanic halfway through, it does it in a way to like help progress the story. So you never feel like you're just like having to like learn these random things to to do anything, right? Right. Um, I guess there's a game that I would talk about is it's The Last of Us. Like it was adapted to a TV show, and the TV show is was going on to be one of the to me probably the best film media of any video game ever yep i i'd have to i don't know there may be a few out there but typically video game movies or tv shows are not very good let's just quick diversion walking dead the telltale series is basically a choose your own adventure story that is a video game Mm -hmm. based on the tv show great story yeah but it was the other way around though right they made that after but i'm just saying like it it exists like there are yeah that is another medium like i think like the witcher great video game but it was book before so i i can't really give that one the tv show is really good too i I can't give them that one but the last of us was a video game that they actually made a really good show on and you know what they did with that is they continued to just tell the stories of the characters so it was a little bit less they kind of removed all of the um the gameplay elements, you know, you weren't, they weren't killing zombies, like a right. hundred zombies right. in, a, in one, one scene or whatever. Like in the game, you're like sneaking around doing that yeah. like every other corner, right? But they, the, the story beats were literally like spot on a lot of times. The cutscenes in the movie or in the TV show and in the game were almost exactly identical in a lot of places. But then they explored those relationships more, which gave you, if you've never played the game, you wouldn't even know, but as a someone that played the game, you you get these different feelings and just more in depth like character development they did in that show, which to me is why it did so well. And it wasn't a you know, and they had a lot of money behind it. Yeah. But they did a good job of storytelling and expanding that story because the video game was one of the best storytelling video games there is, you know. And um, yeah, that's one that stands out to me. I love it. In closing, I want to, we'll both answer this. What is a tip or some tips that people can utilize to tell a better story? Hmm. Tip. Tip one, I would say, and I mentioned this earlier, know where your story is going, what the point of the story is, and how you want to finish it before we start trying to figure out how you're going to start it and get to the climax and, and grow your story. Start there. Number two, don't do anything within your story because it's cool. Whether it's like, I want to rent this camera or it's it's cool. You know, I want to, let me get this lens because it's cool. No. Choose and make every decision based on your gear, your your process. Are you going to use a gimbal? Are you using a dolly? Are you going to use a, you know, just a tripod locked off? Because of the story. Make those decisions in that regard. Um, when I started out, like most people, when they start out, they wanted a gimbal so bad because they just want to run and gun with a gimbal, and they thought that was awesome. I mean, we were both those people. Yeah, yeah. you know. Now I've realized, you know, the gimbal has a purpose, and it's a much less of a purpose than I had figured in the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. I use it for everything. Now it comes out every once in a while when 
we have a shot on the list that needs a gimbal. It's just a tool. So make sure you, you know, learn what tools are used for or why they're used and then start to make decisions based on that. And, and for me, I think authenticity and branding. You know, I, I think it's important to realize that if you're, you know, if you are the story that you're telling yourself from the social media standpoint, for example, your brand is you. And I think it's important to realize that the story that you tell needs to be authentic. It needs to be on brand and it needs to be truly yourself. And I think that it's so easy to go to cool that you miss out on the long-term value that your story has. And, you know, the beautiful thing is no matter how existential you want to take this, your life is a story. Mm-hmm. So let's let's have fun with it. Yeah, and, and work on it one page at a time. One page at a time. And one page at a time, we hope that you enjoyed this podcast and that you flip over to the next page and listen to the next one. Flip back a couple, maybe listen to some of those past chapters in our yeah. story that is this podcast. But either way, we appreciate you checking us out and, and watching or listening along. Feel free to leave us a like, comment, review, all of those fun things. They help out greatly. Share this with a friend. Give us your thoughts in the comments, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Peace.